Hello and welcome. Um, I'm Lindsay Morton and I'm the Senior Manager of Open Science Community Engagement with PLAS. And I'm here today with JB Pauline and Nicholas Ditkoff to have a conversation about open code and its role in communicating uh, reproducible research. And I'm excited to be talking with you both. Uh, I'll just ask you to briefly introduce yourselves, starting with you, Nicola. Thank you, Lindsay. First of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, so my name is Nicolas Stikov. Uh, I am a professor in Montreal at Ecole Polytechnique, and I'm also a researcher at the Montreal Heart Institute at the University of Montreal. My area of research is magnetic resonance imaging, and uh, my passion is uh, better academic publishing. So I'm trying to combine those two in my efforts, and I guess this conversation is a good opportunity to talk about both. And I'm uh, JB Pauline, I uh, work at the uh, Montreal Neurological Institute, the Neuro, uh, in, at McGill uh, in Montreal as well. And my work is about uh, neuroimaging methods and uh, neuroinformatics platforms and uh, tools, uh, as well as uh, a lot of interest as well in the publishing academic system and, uh, and seeing how we can do better. Uh, Thank you both. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you about uh, a recent collaboration, a perspective piece that you published together in computational biology, uh, where you make this distinction between the scholarly article, which you kind of argue functions as a preview of uh, the research and the real scholarly work, which consists of developing software, data, code in order to produce the result. Um, can you talk a little bit about that distinction and, and why it's so important for us to understand, uh, maybe especially in computational work? Uh, sure. Uh, so I, I guess I'll start by saying that there is somebody missing in the conversation, which is Elizabeth Dupre, because this is uh, her work. She was the lead author of that uh, uh, article. Uh, but JB and I are happy to fill in the blanks. So JB, what do you think? Would you like to start or should I go ahead? Um, I, I can start. Uh, it's, uh, I was definitely going to uh, mention Elizabeth as well. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, you, uh, I think the 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 distinction really is to the uh, is about the realization that when we're writing an article, we're kind of like you know, almost sometimes setting a bit of a story. Uh, so uh, so we are writing about the high level and the context and uh, and then when you go into the actual details, uh, you don't have the space or even sometimes the means uh, to actually put all those details. But those details are really what the scholarship is about. Uh, and uh, I think I've, you know in that piece, in that perspective piece, I was uh, referring to the um, uh, we were referring to the uh, don't know who and care about uh, you know uh, previous uh, attempt of uh, you know this separating a bit what is an actual uh, scholarship and what is the, the publicity of it somehow, uh, uh, which is the paper. Uh, but th that idea has been taken and, you know, has grown along the years. Uh, even the Lancet uh, editor in chief uh, recently had an editorial on a bit on that aspect as well. So I think uh, there's a great you know, a, a realization within the academic community that uh, we need to have our scholarship, uh, you know, be more of the actual content and not only on the sort of like you know just the uh, um, you know, publicity aspect of it. Yeah, and and basically, uh, I think it's a natural evolution of the format of the paper of the research article. If you take a look at you know, some of the seminal work in MRI happening in like the 40s, the 50s, these articles were like half a page long. And many of them were not even peer reviewed and not even in MRI. For example, the Watson and Crick paper, uh, the DNA one wasn't peer reviewed because the editor said it was obvious that it's correct. And I think recently things have gotten a little less obvious. <laughs> the articles have gotten longer, uh, work has gotten more collaborative, the barriers to new knowledge are higher and uh, in many fields, ideas are getting harder to find. You know, there is this big, uh, uh, very influential article by Bloom and colleagues from Stanford saying, lately it's just taking us more work to get at new knowledge. There's no more low hanging fruit. So I believe the burden of proof is higher. And as a result, code and data need to enter the picture. Just like peer review wasn't the norm because you know it was evident that certain things were right. Just like court, long articles weren't necessary because it was all about proving uh, equation. I feel that now with uh, the collaborative aspects, with data and code being a big part of the scholarship, 
they need to enter as an integral piece of the deliverable of the final research article. So you both have been involved in some projects and initiatives touching on open code. Um, would you talk, like to talk a little bit about uh, some of what you've been working on and what you're focusing on now? Uh, sure, I guess I'll, I'll take this one. So uh, I, can, I can speak a little about the research in my lab, and then I'll try to generalize to some efforts that we try to build in the brain imaging and MRI community. Um, I became faculty in 2015, and I kind of made it my mission to always supplement my research articles with data and code. I feel like I entered at the right time. These, were, these issues were becoming more and more popular. The replication crisis was becoming more and more evident. Uh, and basically, when I started hiring students for my lab, I was always looking for somebody that has that kind of data coding uh, experience, or at least uh, interest in uh, uh, managing data and code. So uh, we tried a couple of proof of concept articles that I thought were interesting, exciting, hopefully show the way forward. Uh, but again, you know, one was it one bird doesn't make the spring. You know, we realized that for this kind of thing to really catch on, we need to be working on building a community. So just around that time, I was getting more involved with two societies. One is the International Society for Magnetic Resonance and Medicine, and the other is the OHBM, the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. For both of those, I started their blogs, and I started inviting people to you know, talk about their research practices, about what's important. And then in, inevitably, the conversation about code and data would come up. So I'm very happy that six years in, both of those blogs are alive and well, and I'm not even running them anymore. So it's been a successful transition. And I feel that they've really kind of raised the issues of reproducibility, raised the issues of how reproducibility is tied with sharing data and code. And then lots of initiatives like challenges and replication awards have kind of sprung up to emphasize the importance. Uh, so I think that both of these communities are passionate about sharing data and code. They're lacking venues where they can do it. And uh, this is another thing that we try to do. Uh, through the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform and a project called NeuroLibre, where we try to make it easier for people to incorporate they, they, their data and their code into living research objects that are interactive, that encapsulate the code, that make it easy to execute uh, and re-execute the analysis, and hopefully make it easier for other people to check, to verify that the analysis is correct. So uh, I think that's a snapshot of the initiatives that I've been involved over the five, six years, last five, six years. And I think a lot of those complement what JB is going to say next. So I'll just. I don't know yet, but I'm going to say. <laughs> no, um, I think, um, uh, well, I arrived actually in Montreal in 2017. So I'm even younger than uh, Nicola in that respect, at least. Um, and uh, and uh, while building the lab, uh, I really had this, uh, this idea a bit, but uh, you know, along the same lines that you know, we really wanted to do some good science, but we really wanted also to think of the uh, context of in which that science is done. Uh, and, the, and the context of reproducible and open neuroscience is really the one that uh, uh, was, uh, was kind of like the, the glue of the, of the several projects that are, you know, being developed in the, in the lab. Uh, so, uh, and why is that is, is uh, I think it's, it's just, it's just like the uh, the recognition that uh, a lot of the papers that we read, we have a trouble to actually uh, reproduce or reuse. I think that's uh, and that uh, that kind of uh, was the, uh, the, the 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 force really pushing me uh, in that direction. Um, and the and what I thought was also like a key aspect uh, is really uh, you know like recognizing the effort of the the coding and developing a, a platform to share data and all those things. How do we recognize that effort in the academic system is still a bit uh, you know unseen and, and still a bit you know like weak at the moment. Uh, and and therefore, I've, you know, of the project that I've pushed uh, with the uh, OHPM organization that Nicola was mentioning, the uh, is uh, is the Aperture Aperture Neural Project, where you know we uh, that organization could actually sp spin up like a, a publishing platform for uh, hybrid research objects that would contain uh, code, data, uh, Jupyter notebooks, uh, uh, but also possibly videos or like uh, things uh, that are a bit different from the traditional PDF that we usually have in a, in a publishing uh, platform or journal. Uh, so that's one, one project and, uh, and OHPM has actually taken it and uh, it's, I think uh, it's, uh, 
it's only it started only like uh, six, 12 months ago, but uh, it's really already uh, uh, doing something and uh, and and make hopefully making an impact in that uh, publishing alternative research objects. Um, but yeah, I think uh, you know, making sure that both the research uh, the, the research is in the context of uh, of sharing and uh, and sharing and publishing uh, objects that are such as data and code is really what you know with the uh, Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform is one of those uh, projects. Uh, but, uh, but but really you know working on the academic publishing uh, ecosystem as well um, and and working on the standards of what what should the community be doing in terms of uh, how do we review a code how do we review data sets and uh, you know and and uh, i think that's uh, it's it's one of the the thing that i'm uh, interested in working on yeah. and i think wrapping uh, looping back to uh, elizabeth's article that we mentioned in the beginning uh, I think it's a matter of uh, addressing something that's known as the Claire Boat Challenge. Uh, this is an article that came out in the 90s uh, that also David Donahoe contributed to, where they said an article about a computational result is advertising, it's not scholarship. Uh, the actual scholarship is the full software development, uh, code and data that produce the result. So uh, uh, we, we really try to deliver on that. And uh, I feel that uh, a lot of the work that JB is doing in trying to kind of get a society to publish a journal that goes beyond the PDF is the vision that we both get behind. It's like the PDFs are not enough. But then the question becomes, well, what is enough? Uh, is, is a Jupyter notebook the right way to go? No, there's many other alternatives. And we're, you know, we're trying not to reinvent the wheel, but really to kind of build up on top of other people that have been developing these tools and using them in their lab, except that they're not part of the actual publication process. So, you know, Jupyter Notebooks have been around forever. There's hundreds of thousands of Jupyter Notebooks out there, except there isn't a systematized way to actually make them an integral part of a publication. And this is what we're trying to change. But again, we're not the only ones. There's efforts on many fronts. eLife is trying to do that with their ERAs, executable research articles. Other publishers are also trying to incorporate code and data, but there's challenges. And the more you get involved in the process, the more you realize, you know, addressing these issues is not easy, and we're trying to do it one step at a time. It's, uh, Absolutely. It's uh, it's I just like you know, to, uh, to take that ball on you know like uh, um, I, I just remember the um, one of the um, the study that was done on the Jupyter notebooks uh, uh, living on GitHub, and most of them most of them cannot be actually executed, um, and and that's uh, you know and, and and therefore the the new library approach and you know and and the platform that uh, uh, Elizabeth developed and you know, with others like uh, Pierre Bellec and uh, Aga in your lab uh, Nicola and so on, um, do that uh, that platform is really trying to reach bridge that gap, like, you know, where, you know, you, you know that that thing is going to be uh, uh, executable and uh, and we, we can actually uh, obtain results from that notebook. Notebooks are tricky, I must say, in general. Uh, there's, you know, this this is not the best always uh, way of uh, convening uh, uh, good. Uh, but they're they're really useful in terms of uh, documentation and an example of code running and things like that. And for that, they're super super useful. That's really interesting. I I do wonder about you know how lasting any code publication can be. Of course, because you you can't always replicate the system on which it was run and sort of all of those detailed bits and bobs that inter interplaying together. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, this is this is where containers help, and uh, again, some of these can be pretty large, but uh, the whole idea is that you take a capsule, you take a snapshot of whatever the dependencies and the code was at the time of publication, and try to preserve that. Now, computationally, it does require more resources than just storing a PDF, right. but you know, things are advancing fast, and we think that uh, with these approaches where you take uh, um, uh, snapshots of a particular analysis pipeline and you share it uh, using a notebook, possibly through my binder, uh, is one way to ensure that they have longevity. It'd be interesting to look at uh, what JUST is doing for longevity aspect. Uh, so uh, JUST is the uh, Journal of Open Source Software uh, and seeing, and they have like criteria for acceptance of the software in their, in their journal. Uh, we, uh, I mean, I mean uh, just 
you know, this conversation is giving me the idea of looking at uh, how much of the uh, previous, like, you know, a few years back, uh, just uh, publications are actually still, uh, you know, uh, reexecutable or, you know, uh, reusable in some ways. Wonderful. Uh, well, I wonder, um, as you look at kind of the landscape in general and um, some trends that you have observed, you know, where do you see code sharing going or, or where do you hope it might go in the future? I really would like um, journals in general to set up good standards in terms of uh, what should be in a publication and uh, and, and, and having a kind of a you know, force, you know, like with an association of many journals saying, hey, this is, the, this is really like the best practice for publishing something. And um, I think it's kind of like burgeoning and there's uh, many journals that are starting to have best practices that there's not yet a good way of, of kind of saying, hey, those are the good journals because they are doing those things. And, you know, we can label those as, a, you know, an interesting platform to publish because of those practices that they are implementing. Um, uh, the INCF is uh, doing a little bit of, a, you know, like a aspect, I mean, some work in that, in that direction of a standardization aspects of, uh, uh, you know, how do we, uh, um, at least for the data, uh, but also for the code. And, and so the INCF is the International Coordinating Facility for Neuroscience, Neuroinformatic Coordinating Facility. So it's an international organization. And there are other, like a standard organization aspect that uh, uh, work in this direction. But I think, I think we need as a community to come together and say, hey, those are the best practices for publishing code or data, uh, and 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 this is complex because there's a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, edge cases and <laughs> and uh, and different situations. But but it will be so useful, so useful to make sure that you know as a as a whole the community is moving in a in a, in a, in a useful direction. Yeah, I feel a lot of these developments are very field dependent, and maybe neuroimaging is in a fortunate position that we're a small community that's very visible because, you know, it, brain images are cool. So we're trying to kind of set some standards within our own community and then hopefully get uh, other uh, societies and other research fields to know this. Uh, I would say that I really hope that not everybody starts asking people to share code and data and creates mandates <laughs> because then mandates become a way of just, you know, good hearting everything, you know, good hearts law that says the moment something starts being a metric, it stops being a good metric. Mm -hmm. I feel that if journals all of a sudden say everybody needs to share code and data, people will just kind of dump their code and data. It's like, there it is. We made it available, but it's not curated. It's not reviewed. Reviewers don't have time to review it. And then in the end, we end up with not only a 10 page PDF, but we end up with, you know, hundreds of pages of code that nobody ever is going to look into. So uh -huh. yeah, JV. You yeah, know, I was I was thinking like it, sometimes it, is, it would be better than nothing. Oh, <laughs> and, I would uh, say uh, you know I've, I've seen right. I've seen projects where you know I've given a project for instance to a student who is uh, trying to replicate something from the literature uh, on on another data set and uh, and you know and just accessing and on, you know and getting the code. I mean, he's, he's going through an email to authors and saying, "Hey, can you share that code?" Like because uh, otherwise it's just impossible. You have to you know like uh, redevelop the whole thing and we could take. Uh, you know, six months. So I think this this kind of like you know, okay, dumping it is probably the level zero. It's not good, but it's, but it's probably better than not dumping it. <laughs> it's uh, I would say. But uh, I agree. Like uh, you know, to me, uh, coming back to the the no hope about like you know ideas, like uh, uh, reviewing those things is is where we should be going. So reviewing, therefore publishing as an academic object, uh, those things is really what uh, is is uh, is missing as a general practice uh, uh, in the community, I think. But then we get to, you know, being realistic, which is, does a reviewer ever <laughs> want to review code and data, <laughs> especially yeah, when, you know, there's no 
big incentive yeah. to do that. But at the moment, uh, you see, like uh, there are journals that are, like say, just is doing like a uh, specialized in the software aspect. Uh, scientific data uh, is uh, specialized in data sets, uh, and uh, you know others. And many other platforms are actually accepting some of those things. But uh, but we are lacking, I think, uh, a bit of a common guidelines. I mean, there are there have been some guidelines proposed, uh, you know, but we're lacking a bit of a common guidelines of uh, how to deal with all those. I mean, many situations, but, you know, like, uh, and there are many situations, and that's the difficulty of uh, having generic guidelines. But, but as 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 Nicola was saying, for instance, in our own little like you know uh, bubble of neuroimaging brain imaging uh, society, then uh, I think we definitely can start to like you know establish those guidelines and and push that to the journals. And that's the problem to us is that the. We don't control the journals, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, you know the, the the companies or the uh, you know organization that uh, you know control those journals will may say, hey, uh, we're not interested or like yeah. Uh, so so I think uh, a lot of the impetus or like you know will for aperture <laughs> aperture neuro was that you know okay let's let's have a journal that the society is uh, you know is 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 doing and there and therefore uh, we can actually implement those uh, best practices uh, more easily. Uh, this is this is where you know I feel that the mandate, if it comes too soon, it might be counterproductive. So of course I agree with you. Eventually people will share this, but I think it's kind of like peer review. You know how Einstein refused to be peer reviewed in the thirties, <laughs> and then eventually everybody's kind of yeah, you know, eventually work needs to be peer reviewed. So I think just by showing that certain code and data practices work and rewarding people that practice them well before imposing a mandate might be a nice two-step process. You know, rather than burden journals and reviewers with a lot of data and code that's borderline useless, encourage people to produce these in a kind of prestige format, you know, be it uh, by uh, journals highlighting reproducible work, which is something that this blog, MRM Highlights, that I started with the ISMRM is doing. Now it's doing interviews with people that practice exemplary reproducible research practices, be it by granting agencies giving more money for people to build these objects because they take time. And for example, there is there is that um, Google uh, journal. Uh, remind me, JB, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh sorry i'm blanking anyway the, it's gonna it's gonna come it's gonna come as, as i speak but basically google started a journal that said we're gonna share data and code and build beautiful research objects that uh, are going to you know be uh useful to people and they were except that eventually they went on hiatus because they burnt out they said it takes a lot of effort to build this and then it takes even more effort to review it so the people that are passionate are burning out and without some kind of support from the system, unfortunately, we might be stopped there. So for me, yeah, yeah no, I agree. Uh, I think um, a lot will have to come from the fact that, uh, I think that it was a bit also of the aperture idea is that come from the fact that, uh, you know, the academic uh, societies and like the, the academia really needs publishing and recognition of the published objects. Uh, and that's uh, you know if we can make those uh, uh, very well recognized objects uh, you know in uh, being object of code and data as well, I think that's how we incentivize uh, the work really, uh, making sure. Oh, you actually should can't actually publish that very beautiful paper because uh, we've looked at the code and it really it's uh, impossible to uh, you know understand what's going on there and uh, and therefore you should really push that uh, you know the, make some effort in that route. and and authors will do that because they really want the product to be to be out uh, or uh, you know I've, I've been you know often hearing uh, hey you know you shouldn't work on that uh, bathroom package or library because really what you should be doing is doing the next paper that's going to be much better for your cv and therefore for your career and uh, you know your you know next postdoc position or whatever and if instead we have a publisher saying hey you know that library or that that package uh, i really i will give it a high visibility and a high kind of uh, impact uh, then then maybe pis will start to say hey no sure like uh, do that and, and get uh, get that recognition from this uh, from this object so so it's a, it is a change of you know culture but it has to come from the you know our practices of what we publish and and and, and why uh, i agree with the burnout aspect that you know we <laughs> 
<laughs> we can be a bit too demanding, but but best practices are always you know are not necessarily mandates. Uh, you know they're they're you know guidelines and you know they set kind of an objective and then you know it's it's for the communities to actually uh, see how those are best implemented in a, in a reasonable way. Yeah. So talking, talking, talking of incentives, I'll, I'll touch on a topic that I know JB and I disagree and, you know, might be interesting to disagree in public. Uh, if, by the way, Distill is the name of the journal. And basically, it was a bunch of volunteers. They, you know, they just uh, created beautiful research objects. But I feel that volunteer work only gets you so far. You know, like there is, there is an aspect of community building, which is very important. But at some point in publishing, money enters the equation. And, you know, article processing charges being the, the, the best proof. You know, we're talking thousands of dollars. And yet no money exchanges hands in this process. It's driven by volunteers who are building something for free or maybe their supervisor, you know, <laughs> rewards them, but definitely granting agencies don't. None of the article processing charges go towards maintaining this code. And I feel that there is space for actually paying some people that are doing some of the work. Now, it could be just a very basic sanity check, things run, pay me $50 to ensure that it runs, to, you know, pay me half of the article processing charges to actually review your paper properly and tell you what works and what doesn't, which, again, might be a little too ambitious. But there is a sweet spot there. I feel that volunteer effort can only get us so far. And JB, I'll, I'll let you <laughs> respond to that. But uh... it's, it's a complex Issue and I'm not as zero one <laughs> that I might have been like you know ten years ago on that topic, uh, Nicola. Um, uh, but um, I do feel that um, uh, there's there's potentially an issue in trying to pay people that will do a job for like money aspects and uh, you know when I'm reviewing or when you are reviewing or when you we are editing uh, we generally take that as part of our job, um, you know, and, 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 and this might be a, a sort of like, you know, a, a, an aspect that we are lucky to be able to do that and not everyone could. Uh, and I think that's, that's where, Nicola, you may be very right that, you know, in, in the case where, you know, the, 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 the work has to be done by people who actually don't are not privileged in some ways that to have a you know professorship position in a in a you know North American or European universities. I think that's that's where you know maybe that there's there's something to be thought of. But but in general, for myself at least, um, I think the uh, the self motivation is usually a better motivation than the actual uh, monetary reward. Uh, and but I do where I do completely like agree on the on the uh, you know like uh, funding problems with uh, publishing is that uh, there is to me like uh, still uh, you know like a, 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 a crisis of the publishing world, <laughs> which is basically uh, you know like a, uh, we we are uh, hostage uh, to a number of companies uh, that uh, have a, a very high you know uh, profit. Uh, uh, rate, uh, you know, margin. Uh, so uh, I think that that has been, you know, extensively <laughs> recognized, or like you know, that uh, the the classical model where you know you, the, uh, the 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 work is being funded by uh, you know uh, governments or universities. Uh, no one is paying you for writing anything, then no one is paying you for reviewing anything, no one is paying you for editing everything, and then you have to pay five thousand dollars to make that <laughs> that paper being. Uh, uh, published in a, in a journal that that is something definitely not uh, you know acceptable uh, in in some ways in, in that in, in that aspect uh, so uh, so I think having having um, uh, uh, societies being at uh, you know at, at the, you know really in charge of the publishing to me is is one is one thing that we, we should really uh, concentrate on. Uh, that doesn't exclude the companies aspect. Like companies are, you know, they do fantastic fantastic job. They, they you know they can uh, uh, they are necessary, uh, but they shouldn't be really in the driving seat. Uh, and that's uh, I think that's that's where you know things uh, could be uh, possibly uh, improved in the future. It's a long term <laughs> it's a long term battle, but uh, uh, but I think it's uh, it's an important one to not be too hostage uh, from, you know, like uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the academic um, uh, um, societies. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, 
I would be curious, Lindsay, if it's okay to include you in the conversation. Oh, of course. Again, you know, there we are, you know, two academics that agree on, I would say, 80, 90 percent of, of, of what we're talking about. But I'd really be curious about the, the publisher's perspective, in particular, you know, about the compensation and, you know, all the free labor that researchers do for journals. And uh, as JB mentioned, and then, you know, we end up paying a couple of thousand dollars to the publisher. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I will say first, PLOS is really working to move away from APCs. And um, we've got a couple different trials running at the moment that are, you know, moving us in that direction. And I am not an expert in any of them. <laughs> but um, for example, for our, you know, highly selective journals, the journals, of course, that do have the highest impact factor, but are also looking to publish things that are, are likely to be, you know, of great interest to a broad audience. Um, they're basically operating on like a co-op uh, plan. So any research for life, any research done in a research for life country um, by researchers who are based there is uh, free of charge. And then institutions can join as members. And part of that membership fee covers sort of a, a graded uh, Sorry, I'm struggling to describe this well, sort of a, um, a graded publication fee that is much lower than the one-off publishing APC. Um, and the reason for that is that the APC is actually calculated to like the true cost of everything that goes into it, you know, the two staff editors and the two academic editors and the dedicated um, person in production and the to assistants and you know all of those staff all along the way who kind of shepherd the process and orchestrate it and oversee it, which at a journal like a PLOS Biology, for example, is, is really intensive and it's kind of a boutique experience. You know, you work with one person the whole way through. Um, and, and the idea is that by having uh, something that's a little bit more predictable and regular and sort of planned over a year, those costs can be kind of amortized and distributed in a way that's more manageable ultimately and brings the cost down across the board. Um, I mean, I would still say those selective journals are still at the lower end of the APC spectrum for a highly selective journal. Um, then on some of the other journals, so we have some that are essentially uh, operating on a um, society journal plan, right? The only staff that PLOS provides are support staff, um, but all of the editorial decisions are made by members of the community um, who serve as, you know, editors and chief deputy editors and so on. Um, and for those, uh, one of the, again, experimental things is basically a, a institutional flat fee. So um, based on data around the rate of publication and readership at the institution, uh, ins institutions can join as members and publish as much as they want. And if it turns out that they paid too much, uh, they just apply it to the next year. Um, so that's another model that we're, we have um, in operation and testing. But yeah, I mean, I think when open access started, you know, everyone thought, hey, you know, access is all that's required for people to be able to participate. And in a way, if we hadn't had that conversation 20 years ago, we couldn't be having this one now. So it's really important. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think we've all come to the realization, you know, certainly in the last five years, especially, access isn't enough. You have to be able to participate. And so how can we make it so everyone can participate in a way that you know, allows the journals to survive, makes them sustainable, keeps them high quality, and is like fair. You know, we're a nonprofit. We're not here to make a bunch of money, but we do want to survive, right? And to continue to advance the mission. So, I mean, it's a delicate balance. <laughs> but, you know, uh, Plus is definitely one of the good guys. <laughs> you know, in this ecosystem, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, one of the publishers that is doing, I think, uh, is trying to really uh, uh, do the best, uh, you know, for the for the community. But there's uh, but there's always that tension when you are in charge of the of the of the process. Uh, there's always that tension of uh, okay, how much uh, should we you know, like uh, uh, make uh, for like you know whatever we want to do in the future, even if we are a nonprofit, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's always that tension because there's a conflicting sort of a, uh, 
uh, aspect, right? Uh, you know, the, uh, the scientific quality and versus the sele or selectivity aspect versus the, uh, the number of uh, uh, APCs or university or, you know, like having, uh, so I think, I think definitely going towards institution uh, uh, packages is, is, is a good, you know, it's, a, it's good forward. But, but I, would, I would like to make sure that, you know, in the future, uh, academics or academic societies are really uh, uh, in charge of the process and then can they you know subcontract you know some like a to company organization you know like okay uh, we you know this is uh, this is your job to actually do the production and aspects uh, but uh, but if we want to at some stage we can change to someone who's you know going to be better or cheaper or, and i think that that's the it's the uh, it's the uh, it's the fact that we you know like uh, the name of the journals and their reputation are uh, you know attached to the actual to the economic uh, uh, you know governance as well uh, which is which makes the uh, the uh, a bit of a you know a, a yetus here problem uh, absolutely but, well i think from quite a practical perspective you know that reviewing code is a huge job and like who wants it, right? It may be, of course, not at all comfortable, but somewhat analogous to statistics. Um, so I wonder if there's space for like a stats check automated system with, as we often do, journals in general often do with statistics, a dedicated stats reviewer who, mm -hmm. if the automated system hits a certain threshold of like something's wrong with this, uh, then, then a person comes in and looks at it a little bit more closely, who is sort of occupies a space uh, between, you know, volunteer reviewer and, you know, freelance editor. Um, that's something that has worked practically at, at many journals, I think. I really like that idea. And uh, I, I have to say, PLOS has been very forward looking in, in, in general with, you know, the way that you publish and also with the way that you've engaged with us, like this whole conversation happened because Dylan Roscom Zedris, who was at the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, wrote a blog post uh, talking about, you know, going beyond the PDF. And then uh, Ian at PLOS noticed and invited us to do an analysis for PLOS computational biology to look at how many papers are actually sharing code, how many papers are using interactive figure, Jupyter notebooks, et cetera. And then Matthew Boudreau in my lab did that analysis we built a couple of notebooks for the journal, and that was done in coordination with Aga Karakuzu, my student, and a couple of students here in Macedonia, where I'm currently on sabbatical. And then that resulted in a survey, and then the survey was reported as a blog post. So I feel that you're doing it the right way, you know, kind of starting from, oh, there's something interesting, let's gauge interest among the community and see what kinds of deliverables would be useful. So by all means, there is lots of space for in-between tasks something that's not exactly free reviewing, something that's not exactly a full-time job, but you know, freelance work that actually improves the scholarship, which is, I think, everybody's goal. At the same time, um, uh, to me, like uh, reviewing a PDF with like, uh, you know, uh, you know hypothesis, a method, like the math, uh, whatever, you know, the, uh, is, 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 you know, is, we've been trained, we've been, you know, to do this, like we, we are doing this as a reviewers, and a, uh, and I think we just haven't been trained to do the same sort of thing uh, for for code of or like an object. But but I don't see a fundamental shift, uh, you know, between uh, let's say the uh, the experimental design or you know like uh, and the and 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 the code. Uh, this, this, to me, it's just like a, another output and another thing to look at to see. The, the, the hard question is, what are the criteria? When do you say that something is that you are? And that's and that's exactly the same problem that people have with actual actual you know uh, article as well. You know, so th that problem is just like a you know it's a community training. It's a, like a, it's it's getting the practices and it's getting the. Uh, uh, the uh, the guidelines uh, aspect right uh, and that's uh, probably like a you know a, a one step forward to you know like a, and, and you know step by step and 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 with, with the feedback and and slowly getting it right uh, but uh, I don't I don't 
feel there's a very strong difference between like, you know, uh, uh, even data, like, you know, data sets, like uh, I was mentioning scientific data, you know, we, we look at, we look at data set, the descriptors, you know, we open the images, we uh, look at, you know, the structure on the disk, or, you know, are they really easily downloadable, or like, you know, what's, uh, what is the license? Uh, I mean, and that's just, we learn to do that for data sets. Uh, I don't, yeah, uh, there's definitely a way of, of broadening, broadening those uh, output uh, research outputs and, and, and getting the review uh, visible on those, on those outputs. But I would argue that we're not trained well to review PDFs, or if we are, we forget it. <laughs> and the fact that the reviews are private makes us forget that very easily. You know, it's really easy for all kinds of conflict of interest to creep up when you know that nobody else is going to read this review, aside from the person who you're actually asking to make changes and they can't push back too much. So I feel that there is some space for actually making PDF review better and then have code review follow because people review code way more publicly than, than they review PDFs. GitHub issues do not exist for PDFs. And I'm not asking for people to sign their reviews. I actually am against signed, signed reviews, but I'm 100% for public reviews, something that eLife is experimenting with, you know, consensus reviews that makes the readers aware what the issues are and also dampens the you know uh, reviewers uh, in their in their in, in the way that they criticize the work uh, now again that might be a two-edged sword but i do feel that transparency in that review process would be beneficial for equality for promoting younger researchers and for really understanding what are the issues with uh, a particular work and, and lindsay i'd be curious yeah sorry uh, jb Oops, no, I didn't mean to interrupt, uh, but I was thinking also for recognition of the work of reviewing, where you can actually publish those uh, those things and then possibly attach the name when things are like, you know, cooled down and like, you know, things are published. And uh, so uh, so for that aspect, and also it's uh, it's clear to me that I, I do a better job when I know that my review is going to be read by a <laughs> great number of people than when uh, you know I can I can get away with a couple of lines of uh, of comments and I think that's uh, it's which is a bad really bad uh, practice. Uh, so yeah, no, definitely, uh, Nicola, on, on on that side. Uh, we got a dog in the conversation. That's great, <laughs> uh, Lindsay. I would be curious. Uh, how is Klaus? addressing the issue of public reviews. Is this something on the radar? And uh, to what extent is, the, is it possible to make some changes for post-publication peer review and transparent peer review in general? Yeah, so I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so PLOS is um, very, very supportive of transparent peer review and have offered it optionally on our journals for a couple of years now. Um, and the way it works with us is as the author receives their accept decision, they have the opportunity to choose, yes, I want my peer review package published or no, I don't. And that'll include the editor's decision letters along with the reviews, the reviewer's names if they've chosen to sign, and also the author's response to the reviewer's comments. And then that has its own unique DOI and it appears alongside the manuscript and it also gets ingested into our various archives and stuff. I think that an area where we would certainly be interested in exploring more, but are less strong is the post-publication review. You know, of course we offer commenting and, you know, authors are notified if there is a comment and they can respond, but that's kind of the extent of it at this point. Uh, we also do take into account reviews that appear on uh, preprints that are submitted to us for consideration. Um, I think on community review, there's a really interesting conversation to be had about, um, you know, power and authority and consensus and, and how that might shape individuals review if they're interacting with somebody who's, you know, perhaps more experienced than they are, uh, perhaps making it difficult to bring forward a concern that someone else hasn't caught or, you know, something like that. But um, that is another area that I can tell you we've definitely discussed. Um, internally and um, are really interested in exploring more. So at PLOS, I think, is, is pretty much interested in seeing what the possibilities might be and what's going to be optimal for people. No, it's a, it's a lovely um, experiment um, and very interesting. Um, did you want yeah. to go 
for another <laughs> question, uh, Lindsay? Absolutely. Well, I, that was a wonderful discussion of kind of what um, sort of the other players in the ecosystem, whether it be authors, publishers, universities, funders could do to make code sharing um, you know, easier and more achievable. I wonder if there, is there anything else in that list of, um, you know, possible ways to enable code sharing that uh, we should call out or have we kind of covered it? I, I mean, I, I feel that some of, some of these things might bleed into new technologies that are being developed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, of course, you know, we could speculate about what a future of a journal would be and how it might be more tightly coupled to the granting agencies and maybe create this kind of, you know, more uh, smooth pipeline from the awarding of a grant to actually delivering the results, which would make it easier to uh, produce negative results, to conduct application studies. I feel that all those issues haven't been touched, but again, they're even bigger problems, so I'm not sure if we want to go there. I feel that, you know, publishers are just really the last chain of a, of a pipeline that's pretty outdated and uh, we could be experimenting at all stages from the funding to the actual documentation, to the deliverables, to the replications, to the uh, negative results sitting in drawers. Uh, but uh, all that is related to code sharing uh, and it's probably subject for another conversation. Absolutely. Speaking of new technologies, do you have any opinion on kind of Web3 and, and blockchain technologies and how that might touch on code sharing? Uh, I, I do. Uh, <laughs> maybe should I, should I take the lead there? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, Web3 is this nebulous term, right? You throw it around and, you know, see what sticks. But there has been lots of experiments in terms of how you can you know, do organizations, how you can uh, tokenize incentives, you know, what, what could work better under a Web3 system. So let's just assume that Web3 actually works and it's not as clunky as, you know, we see it to be these days. I think that there is uh, lots of ideas related to the way the journal functions. So, you know, maybe a decentralized journal, a journal as a DAO, as a decentralized autonomous organization, where there's stakeholders and, you know, the editors are part of it, but the reviewers also. And then there's all these uh, uh, social tokens that might reward participation so that it becomes a process that everybody's invested in. I think that's exciting. You know, I don't know if it's feasible and who knows how many challenges there would be, but uh, that is the promise of Web3, decentralized things. And I feel that journals have been very centralized uh, pretty much since the 1940s or 50s. Um, uh, smart contracts, data-driven workflows, these are the kinds of things that are kind of inherent in the whole Ethereum blockchain. And uh, maybe what you can do is make analysis that's really nicely automated. And on top of it, provide something that for me is very important, both in terms of functionality and in terms of privacy, which is provenance. Uh, people say that uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, they're kind of like the mother of all cookies. <laughs> so you could track everything that happened, which again, might sound bad, but it also would mean you also know exactly where the data came from, how it was used, and whether it was properly used because of all the privacy restrictions. So I feel that there is space for ensuring that these bits of code and data that are being shared are not abused in the public domain but you know, control a little bit the way that uh, they uh, are shared by researchers, and especially when it comes to data, a lot of it being confidential, ensuring that it doesn't end up in the wrong hands. So I would say that's probably the more low-hanging fruit, whereas this whole kind of idea of let's distribute journals and have us all be in the governance of a journal sounds good, but I'm not sure if it's going to happen. I mean, my take on this is that uh, I think um, a lot of the technologies we probably have, you know, like it's, it's to me, I mean, the, um, the issues it really is more on the cultural and, uh, and incentivization issues rather than the, uh, than uh, is blockchain going to solve our publishing problem? <laughs> I think the, the answer to, to that is probably no. Uh, and, but, uh, but you can solve some, you know, specific technical problem for sure. I, I think that's uh, you know, that's useful. But the but the our work should 
probably be more on uh, making sure that uh, the uh, the stakeholders, the uh, the granting agencies, the, uh, the you know like uh, are really pushing, and universities are really pushing to a, a better ecosystem in terms of uh, openness and uh, and uh, and governance. Uh, so I think that's that would be my my take on on those. I mean. Uh, However, technologies are they can they can you know provide like a, some incentivization. <laughs> I think the uh, you know the, the new early brave uh, Jupiter books are fantastic. They are just great to see and to look, and therefore they they, they do appeal. Uh, I think that uh, we should definitely should use that uh, as much as we can. Wonderful. What do, you, what do you think, Lindsay, about Web three? Uh, is plus? Oh, well, uh, no, plus is not exploring Web three at the moment that I'm aware of, at least. But no, I do think it could be really exciting for uh, even the publishing process itself. You know, things like having um, open peer reviews that can never be severed from, and having data that can never be severed from the document, and having this string that you know, sort of guides you through the process and imagine it with pre-registration involved perhaps and mm -hmm. even the um, the funder peer review perhaps included. It could be, I think, incredibly valuable. And mm -hmm. I often think of um, a lot of what we do at PLUS sort of isn't changing any of the process in particular very much. All it's doing is turning it outward facing. And that alone has, you know, this enormous impact. And I think if there were a single tool that would allow us to do that in one fell swoop, that would certainly make our lives a lot easier. <laughs> but of course, you know, the, all of that is driven by, you know, what people want and need and, you know, what's appropriate for different fields being really different, of course, if you're dealing with, for example, patients or endangered species or, you know, there is information that does need to remain still protected. Um, but no, I think it's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to, um, knowing that we're kind of at the end of our time today, ask you each a question that um, I ask everybody. Uh, what motivated you or inspired you to become involved in open science and, and what keeps you kind of active and engaged and continuing to work on these things today? Uh, Goes for okay, <laughs> I'll start. Uh, um, I think um, the motivation really is uh, several layers. Uh, one that it's basically more fun. <laughs> uh it's uh, it's also like uh, I, I can see it's uh, you know it's more efficient also to work with uh, that kind of mindset uh so uh so i think the the, the fun and the and the efficiency uh and the uh, and, and the, like uh, really working against the non reusability of our research output is really the thing that has bugged me for a long time like you know we put all those research out you know results outside and then you know what is actually reusable how can we build on the top of that is is it's pretty in a bad space at the moment uh, still uh, so i think uh, uh, open science has definitely been one of of the avenue to actually uh, mend that problem. Uh, so uh, limit the waste, <laughs> uh, I would say, uh, or increase the efficiency if you wanted to say, say it in a positive manner. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely been one of the uh, uh, yeah, uh, driving force um, in some. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the way that I completed my PhD. So I, I was at Stanford. I did my undergrad master's and PhD there. And I got a PhD in electrical engineering, uh, working on magnetic resonance, uh, having published zero research articles. And uh, I mean, you know, you, you tell this story many times, and in the end, it turns out like you always planned it that way. But uh, there was some kind of, you know, a, a willingness to do things slightly differently. And I was encouraged by my supervisor, John Pauly, to proceed that way. And the reason is because I was always frustrated by the 10 page PDF format. I feel that, you know, we spend all our waking hours writing it, but so few people read it. And I tried to be very uh, careful about what I actually put in writing and how I would like it distributed. Uh, and despite that dismal publishing start, I ended up getting a faculty position. I ended up getting tenure. So I must have done something right in the process. But I think 
what stuck with me from 2009 when I got my PhD until now, what, 13 years later, is that I have this frustration with the way that we communicate our science. And I'm motivated by negative emotions. You know, <laughs> when I see something that's broken, that, that's what makes me want to fix it. And there was an article that was written by uh, Mark Strasser. Uh, uh, it's, it, the article is called The Business of Extracting Knowledge from Academic Publications. And my favorite quote from there is, close to nothing of what makes science actually work is published as text on the web. It's a controversial statement, but I tend to subscribe to that. I've seen how academics read papers. I know how I read papers. You look at the title, you scan the abstract, you look at the figures, the captions, and then you give the whole paper for your student to read because they don't have the background. So for them, maybe reading the whole paper is useful. So I'd like to cut that clutter. I feel like there is space for replacing some of the words with something that's a little bit more concrete, which would be code and data. So I, I wrote a blog post, my 10, pa my 10 year battle with 10 page PDFs. There's a part two coming and it's basically saying why I could not see myself writing 10 page PDFs during my PhD. And uh, now, you know, you have to do it. You have to get grants. But I feel that also there is a way to remake the grant system that's a little bit faster, a little less bureaucratic. 10-page PDFs and 100-page grant applications. <laughs> Who reads them? Uh, and I think yeah. maybe, maybe we, we missed out one word, which is the, uh, the Wisconsin fair aspect. And, uh, you know, if, if I had to pick up something in the fair, like, you know, like piggybacking on what you're saying, Nicola, if I have to pick up something is, uh, in the fair, it's really the reusable aspect. Uh, exactly, exactly. What can be, <laughs> as you said, what can be reused uh, from, uh, from those things? Uh, and, you know, and, and yeah, it's really, to me, we are dreadfully inefficient <laughs> uh, in, a, in, in an area where, you know, money is limited, uh, time is limited, uh, and, 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 and yeah, it, it, I, I think I, I subscribe to the frustration and therefore the motivation to, <laughs> to move things uh, in, in a more efficient way. But to end on a more positive note, there is definitely lots of exciting things happening. Fast grants, COVID really kind of made people aware that a grant can be given in a matter of days and it doesn't have to be very large to actually has an impact. So, you know, there's emergent ventures. Now the UK and HR is trying this. Um, uh, uh, FTX is trying it, you know, like a, 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 a crypto company is trying to give fast grants. Even some bloggers are funding science. You know, there's uh, Astro Codex 10, Scott Alexander is giving out money for nonprofit science research. And then there's also uh, new initiatives, uh, some from Silicon Valley, some from nonprofits uh, that are trying to do science differently. There's ARC Institute, Arcadia, there is new science, uh, all these different ways of looking at science and trying to improve on something that we realize has diminishing returns. So I'm passionate, I'm excited. I think there's lots of cool things happening and publishing will find a way to incorporate all these things and finally make it easy for people to consume all that new science. So I see light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> And also, uh, just to reinforce one thing, I'm, I'm thinking of like a CGI, for instance, has this wonderful granting for software. You, we were talking about code and software a lot, right? Uh, they actually, you know, have specific grants for, you know, maintaining and growing uh, on the software and code aspect. Uh, I think that, that is also a very kind of encouraging uh, direction where, you know, uh, granting agencies are recognizing those objects are being like the more uh, first class citizen objects uh, in our publishing uh, world. Thank you both. This has been um, such a great conversation and so interesting. And um, I know I've learned a lot. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk with me today. Likewise, thank you for inviting us. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it was great. <laughs>